Ja, guten Abend. Auch von mir herzlich willkommen. Mein Name ist Ronny Blaschke. Ich bin Journalist, Autor, habe mich in den vergangenen Jahren auf die Golfregion spezialisiert, war dreimal in Katar, auch in den Vereinigten Arabischen Emiraten, im Oman und möchte den Fußball im Nahen Osten ein bisschen mehr untersuchen. Und dieses Panel, diese Tour und die gesamte, die gesamte Zeit vor der WM zeigt uns so ein bisschen die Kompliziertheit, die Komplexität der Sportindustrie. Sie führt sie uns vor Augen. Auf der einen Seite haben wir diese WM in Katar, wo es keine freien Wahlen gibt, keine Gewerkschaften, wo Homosexuelle mit Verfolgung rechnen müssen. Aber auf der anderen Seite hat Katar mehr als 20 Milliarden Euro in deutsche Unternehmen investiert, nicht nur in den FC Bayern, sondern auch Volkswagen, Porsche, Hapag Lloyd und viele deutsche Unternehmen haben auch an der Infrastruktur in Katar sehr gut mitverdient. Also es ist nicht schwarz und weiß und wir wollen uns beiden Polen heute Abend nähern. Das zweite Panel über die Kommerzialisierung, das stelle ich Ihnen dann später vor. Aber jetzt geht es erstmal um die Situation der Arbeiter und Arbeiterinnen in Katar. Es ist ein großes Privileg, das wir unsere Gäste heute hier haben. Ich äh, habe selbst gemerkt bei den Recherchen in Katar und viele andere Journalistinnen und Menschenrechtsorganisationen merken es, dass es gar nicht so leicht ist, Menschen vor das Mikrofon zu bekommen in Katar. Deswegen ist es gut, dass wir sie heute bei uns haben. Und drei Gäste sprechen stellvertretend für mehr als 2,5 Millionen Menschen, die in Katar ähm, arbeiten. Und es gibt nur 300.000 katarische Staatsbürger. Ich stelle sie Ihnen ähm, von links nach rechts vor. Neben mir sitzt ein Aktivist aus Nepal, der in Katar gearbeitet hat, der sich organisiert ähm, mit äh, Menschen aus Nepal, aber auch darüber hinaus in Gewerkschaften, der viele Interviews gibt. Und ich habe ihn bei mehreren Terminen gesehen und bin ganz begeistert von seiner Leidenschaft. Schön, dass du wieder dabei bist. Willkommen, Krishna Shrestha. Unser zweiter Gast hat ebenfalls in Katar gearbeitet und wird das auch weiterhin tun, als Elektriker, als Klempner seit 2007 schon. Und auch er hat sich für den nepalesischen Gewerkschaftsverband GFONT eingesetzt und ja, auch in klandestinen Treffen. Gewerkschaften sind in Katar nicht gestattet, man muss sich im Geheimen treffen und Verbündete für sich suchen. Schön, dass er da ist, Jevan Taramu. Und auch unser dritter Gast, er kommt aus Kenia, er hat als Wachmann in Katar gearbeitet und er hat die menschenunwürdigen Arbeitsbedingungen dort am eigenen Leib erlebt und er wollte sich das nicht gefallen lassen. Er hat darüber gebloggt im Internet, in sozialen Medien und auch da verrate ich nichts Neues. Es gibt diverse Gesetze, die Kritik am Regime, Kritik am Islam, also alle kontroversen Themen nicht gestatten. Und deswegen ist unser Gast festgesetzt worden brutal verhört worden und was da passiert ist, das wird er uns erzählen und vor allem, welche Motivation er daraus geschöpft hat, sich weiter zu engagieren und ich glaube 200 Interviews gegeben hat in den vergangenen äh, zwei Wochen, um, um Wissen bereitzustellen und Aufmerksamkeit zu schaffen. Schön, dass er da ist. Willkommen, Melkam Bidali. And for the conversation, I would like to switch Switch, switch, switch in English. The only mistake I make tonight, I promise. Um, Krishna, I would like to start with you. It is a paradox situation in Qatar. We have 2.6 million people and 300,000 Qatari citizens, so 10%, and 400,000 people from Nepal. So more people from Nepal in Qatar than people from Qatar in Qatar. Um, and I would like to widen the context at the beginning. Um, It's brutal, it's, it's, um, there is a lot of suppression going on. But before people go to Qatar, they have to pay money for the agencies and they have to have debts and it takes years to pay these debts back. Can you tell us a little about the pressure, um, the, the agencies, um, yeah, the recruitment? Oh, thank you very much for the question and uh, thank you everyone for coming to <clears throat> hear us and uh, in this very beautiful evening and in this very interesting uh, topics. 
And uh, thanks Rosa Luxembourg Foundation for inviting us to this tour and having all this um, very interesting and interactive session so far. So I will be very brief and <laughs> going straight to your question about that, uh, how <coughs> the, uh, the population composition in Qatar between the migrant uh, population and local population is very different and uh, disproportional, I would say. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, migrant worker communities and migrant worker are normally perceived as a servant, commodity, and a uh, you know service. So the social integration process is something that we cannot imagine what we are having right now in this event or in any part of other world. So uh, this is really complex that how the state runs socially is totally different and we never uh, imagine the situation. And uh, coming to you another question about the migrant worker recruitment fee that um, millions of migrant worker, including Nepali, Bangladeshi and Indians have to pay a very huge amount of money before they go to any of the country like Qatar to secure the job. And uh, in, in case of Nepal, that is up to like 100 thousand Nepali rupees, which is equivalent to around 1,000 euro. So normally the migrant worker either have to take out loan or sell their livestocks or sell their personal properties and who they already have indebted. Um, and while they come to uh, Qatar, then even their contracts is been replaced or, you know, uh, that the uh, contract they do in Nepal sometimes doesn't get the uh, same uh, contract in Qatar. So they have like contract deception and that is another case which uh, will put them into a kind of forced situation and uh, the other condition of the migrant worker in Qatar, including the basic and fundamental human rights. It's so, you know, worse that we cannot imagine being here. Thank you. Jivan, you worked or you work as an electrician, as a plumber, and labor unions are not allowed in Qatar. The social media are closely monitored. How do you do it? How do you organize them yourself? How do you, how do you create a network with other workers? Jivanji, uh, I Qatar ma 2007 dekhi kaam garirhanu bhayo cha as a plumber ra electrician ko rup ma ra Qatar ma chai esari worker union athwa labor union banauna ko lagi tethi sahaj chaina tapai afai pani migrant worker hunu huncha te bhayo karanle garda kheri tapai kaam kasari garnu huncha ra labor union haru kasari athwa tyo jifan jasto group ma kasari kaam garnu huncha bhannu huncha sarpratham सबै जनमा नमस्कार धन्यवाद प्रश्नको लागि 2007 देखि अहिले सम्म म कतारमा निर्माण क्षेत्रमा काम गरिरहेको छु र यो प्रवासी श्रमिकहरुले त्यहाँ काम गर्दै गर्दाखेरि अथवा त्यहाँ हरेक देशका श्रमिकहरुले त्यहाँ कुनै पनि संगठन बनाएर त्यहाँको आवाज उठाउने उठाउन पाउने अधिकार छैन तथापि अहिले त्यहाँको कतार सरकारले श्रमिक कानूनमा केही परिवर्तन गरेको छ कम्पनीमा एउटा जोइन्ट कमिटी बनाएर समस्याहरु राख्ने अधिकार त दिएको छ तर ट्रेड युनियनको अधिकार छैन त्यसो भए कुनाले हामीले बिदाको बेलामा काम ड्युटी सके सके पछाडि हप्ताको एक दिन बिदा हुन्छ त्यो बेलामा हामी प्रवासी श्रमिकहरुको बीचमा छलफल गर्ने र हाम्रो समस्याहरुलाई कसरी सम्मानित ठाउँमा पुर्याउन सकिन्छ भनेर हामीले एउटा सामाजिक संस्थाको रूपमा हामीले काम गर्छौ Hello, good evening and namaste everyone. My name is Jivan Taramo and uh, I have been working in Qatar since 2017 and uh, uh, as an electrician and uh, carpenter, as you rightly mentioned that it is not really possible to form any kind of uh, worker union or association in Qatar and we are also binded by that law that we often don't get that open <coughs> opportunity to form any uh, kind of worker association or union. But despite of having that kind of limitation, we migrant worker normally get one day days off uh, during the week. So normally Friday. So that is the uh, time we have uh, the opportunity to interact and meet with our other fellow migrant worker and we utilize that uh, time uh, to uh, informally associate ourselves and uh, uh, 
uh, that is how we uh, interact with our community and uh, through the other uh, international trade union or international organization and uh, through our um, Nepali embassy, we have been raising the migrant worker uh, issues, uh, demanding the migrant worker rights, but uh, having the worker <coughs> union or uh, association is not possible and we have to do uh, from different way uh, that uh, in informal, informally. Thank you. Malcolm, the Qatari government repeatedly says that the kafala system is abolished and there are chances now to complain and to start legal actions against the, the companies. Your experience was quite different. Can you please tell us what happened after your blogging, after your, your coverage in the social media? Yeah, yeah, so first of all, I'd like to thank RLS for inviting us over to Germany. And uh, thank you all for showing up. So my story begins way before even I you know, uh, began even blogging. So that was around 2016 when I first went to Qatar. So after being exposed to all those conditions uh, and all those various aspects of day-to-day -day life. So I've been in Qatar for about four and a half years, uh, give or take. And uh, the conditions there are generally you know, across the board, might depend on different company to different company, but across the board, uh, cramped living conditions. This is where you live like six, eight, 10, 12 people in one room, depending on uh, how generous the employee is feeling. And uh, long working hours, uh, according to the Qatar labor law, it's supposed to be eight working hours, uh, eight hours a day, uh, plus an additional two hours over time. Uh, but you find companies working in excess of 12, 13, 14 hours, that's not even factoring in the transport it takes for you to get back and forth. Uh, then you have uh, the working conditions. So temperatures in summer exceed uh, 50 plus degrees and humidity gets to about 60, 70, 80, uh, depending on the month. And uh, also in winter as well, it gets really cold. People only think about Qatar, you know, the heat, but it, all, it also gets like really cold. Um, and then you have repression of various freedoms. So freedom of uh, movement, freedom of association, and then uh, freedom of speech, and then discrimination, understand? So freedom of speech is where, you know, my story comes in. So people are not allowed to share their personal stories or even uh, congregate and, 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 and uh, discuss about what they would like. Uh, the state sees this as dissidence uh, or something along those lines. And uh, that was kind of what happened to me. So all these conditions, living conditions, working conditions, one day they just, you know, enough was enough. And I decided to share my story. And in sharing my story, I shared the story of uh, the people who are in me in the room, the people who I went to work with. So I told the story, I told our story, and um, I used Twitter and Instagram, and I leveraged the power of social media, you know, to, to bring about change. And surprisingly enough, um, I actually didn't expect this, but uh, change happened almost instantly when I published uh, my first article on uh, migrantrice.org. And um, when, as soon as the changes happened, um, a light bulb like went off in my head. So you mean to tell me that I can change things just by writing about them, you know, uh, that simple. So by the first like article, change happened and um, on seeing the success of that, I began doing more articles and Twitter and Instagram and uh, that was when until I got arrested one year later. Uh, yeah, long story. Yeah. So, but then after the arrest, um, can you a little bit elaborate on that? What happened? And um, at, at one point they, they released you and you went home to Kenya, but that was complicated as well. Uh, yeah, definitely complicated because uh, the people who took me were the Qatari State Security Bureau, uh, the SSB. So they mostly deal with like national security stuff and, you know, or so that's what uh, Google says, you know, uh, they're basically hush hush group kind of people. So they arrested me, took me to interrogation, asked me who I was working for, why I am receiving money from uh, foreign agents, uh, quote unquote, uh, to spread disinformation, why I am associating with um, you know, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Migrant Rights, so all these NGOs. And um, they basically 
put out a statement uh, on the GCO, that's the government communications uh, you know, office, uh, saying that charge that I was receiving money from foreign agents to spread disinformation when that was not the case. All the things I wrote about were true, and these were things that we were going about on a day-to-day -day basis, and not just our company. All It was across the board, like all, multiple companies. So once released from prison, uh, I'm not really sure how that happened, to be honest, but I was released from prison, but I, I was under a travel ban, so I couldn't travel out of the country until I finished the court case. And then, luckily enough, civil society stepped in, uh, that is the ILO and the ITUC, and also students from Qatar Foundation, uh, they stood up for me and they um, you know, advocated for my release. And that happened, and then I went back to Kenya. Um, I was not deported, contrary to what uh, you know you might expect, but I felt um, staying in Qatar would prove counterproductive because I would eventually go back to writing about other people, uh, our struggle, and then I'd be arrested again. So it was a, so I had to go back to Kenya. Yeah. There are speculations that within the society of the Qatari citizens, again, 300,000 people, people say several thousands, if not more than 20,000 people belong to the dynasty of the Al-Thani, the family that is for uh, centuries now dominant in Qatar. So uh, the heads, many heads, many bosses of the companies, they're, very, they're related to the, to, the, to the company. A country without check and balances, how should they um, fulfill the reforms? Krishna, another question. This is now the end of this tour. You've seen now hundreds of people. You had interviews. Um, there are more events coming up. There are podcasts. There are exhibitions at Germany, at least. There is a debate going on. What do you expect of us? What, how can, how, what can we do more to, to help um, migrants and workers in, in Qatar? Um, what, what would you say? What can uh, Western European society and its civil society do? Yeah, it is so great that we have been having this really rich and very interesting conversation around the uh, the massive violation of migrant worker rights in Qatar and uh, our trying to raise awareness about uh, the living conditions, working conditions and other human rights violation in Qatar to many of Nepali migrant worker as well as other migrant worker and uh, which is really interesting things it's uh, uh, you know happening now and I think I need to you know uh, let you take you back uh, one and a half sorry two and a half years ago that uh, I and one of my another colleague had been you know able to come and then share uh, this kind of uh, stage and share migrant worker uh, stories uh, in Munich and Berlin and now it is happening in a bigger scale that we already been to uh, 10 nine or ten uh, different cities and raising this uh, you know uh, awareness with the <clears throat> German local people and population and we have been receiving really warm welcome and very uh, positive insight message from all the medias and the people who uh, came to the event so it's already great that we have been uh, so get supported and it gives a sense of uh, you know a belonging a sense of support and sense of uh, feeling togetherness and brotherhood that is, this is something we definitely count from our individual level that migrant workers are not alone that they are doing this kind of work but at the same time there are international communities and international uh, let's say organizations uh, putting uh, all efforts together uh, to stand by the side of the human rights and uh, to protect, uh, fulfill and respect it. That is one from the individual level we <clears throat> migrant worker can feel. Uh, but uh, having said that, uh, it is not definitely enough that uh, uh, from the, let's say, a system level or from the bigger level that uh, many things could be done and many things need to be done. Uh, and uh, we do not maybe expect, but wish that <clears throat> the international community like like Germany or the international organization like Rosa Luxembourg Foundation have much more like uh, maybe a responsibility and accountability that uh, they could do from their personal side. And there has been constant, um, you know, debate about whether the football should happen in Qatar or not and where, where we can just like, you know, uh, intervene and what will be the right approach to do and so on. Uh, but uh, we as a migrant worker uh, definitely feel that support, but at the same time, <clears throat> we uh, wish that uh, if your 
let's say football fan or citizens or the international organization uh, put much more pressure to your own government and the football association or to the FIFA uh, through maybe campaigning or uh, having petitions uh, and uh, you know um, put pressure to Qatar government at the same time so that the human rights condition would be improved uh, much more uh, uh, much more than what we are experiencing now Chivan, this beautiful uh, glittering skyline everybody sees and the shopping malls and the cinema and the growing sports facilities, they are mostly built for the Qatari citizens. What do you expect? What would you like to have? What uh, do the migrant workers need that they would feel integrated and included into the Qatari society? So, even the Kotarma Tultula Bawan or Bonegasan, the Tultula Samrazana or Bonegasan, Ratio Sain, Sabay, Kotari, local circle lagi Bonegosa, this man say by the Sikros Garmaika, Sramik or related to the Hiri, Sodopoe Gorna Paikasaina, Tova, the lay Proe Gorna Pound Boykosaina, Junse, Kotari or Gulagi, Matri Boniku Boni Banunso, then either Samajik, Bibit Kakura, Ruponich, and this legal Dakiri, Topanku Bichar Maki Laksa, Topai Sramik. एक भाई रा त्यां को लोकल कम्युनिटी संग कसरी सही अंतर्गुलन होना सकें जा अथवा तब एको बिचार मां की लाख सा कसरी श्रमिक हो रहे सही त्यां को स्थानीय बासिंदा हो संग घुलमिल भाई रा बासना सक्षम धन्यवाद आइले सम्मान दिनमार क्षेत्र में बने का धेरी बहुत ना रू त्यान रहे कु कतार बैसी और कु नहीं था तथा भी आइले सरम सिविर और उपनी धेरे बनी सही कह सन जब कि सरमी करो बस नहीं ठाउ और कु सुविधा जनक थी है ना ती ठाउ और कु कुरालाई हमें ले बस नहीं स्थान और सुविधा जनक सही ना लगाये सरमी का धेरे समस्या रु सन बनने कुरा अंतर्राष्ट्रीय सरम संगठन लगा� कुरा रख देखिरी कि कुरा रुस समाधान बने तरह में कि समाधान वही कसन तथा भी आइले सरम सिविर रु बने कसन कि सरमिकर लाई रखने को लगी र आमिल लेतिहां को स्थानीय आइले यो कला भरु संग सौ कार्य करे रा हमरे कुरा रखने आवश्यक पाए कसन त्यां एनआरएन लगाए अन्य संस्थार को माध्यम बाटा हमेले रखने प्रयास करे कसन र अजय पनी त्यहाँ को प्रवासी सर्मी घर को लागी सुविधा जनक र त्यहाँ पावन पनी अधिकार को बारे में कई वहाँ ले कौन से सहगोन भागों सा तसर्थ हाँ मिले त्यहाँ रहेगा स्थानीय लोकल कलाबरु अथवा स्थानीय त्यहाँ को प्रतिनिधि रुसंग सह कार्य करेगा सुविधा जनक हुनो परसा बनने हैं मिले आवाज तराहे का सों तथा भी हैं मिले सीधे रखना ना सके कुंड डाले हैं मिले कोई दे बुद्धा का द्रुप में पत्र मार्फत रखने कर सों धन्यवाद थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर द क्वेश्चंस एंड या इस डेफिनेटली द मॉडर्न इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर डेवलपमेंट इन कतार including those football stadiums and big big high rise building are definitely one big you know economic aspect of qatar which has been uh, developed by the migrant worker <clears throat> Uh, hard work and uh, the uh, Qatari community have been enjoying those facilities but migrant workers are often sometimes or often or sometimes uh, doesn't have uh, you know access to those kind of infrastructure or to enjoy those kind of facility and uh, uh, however compared to uh, past 10 years now there has been slight improvement in the housing and accommodation of migrant workers so there are many uh, you know uh, suffering and many of the bad situation that migrant worker have but at least there has been some kind of uh, a migrant worker settlement has been developed compared to past uh, 10 years but that is not enough for migrant workers so we uh, want similar kind of you know facilities and similar kind of settlement for the migrant worker as well and uh, through the our uh, initiative 
uh, of Nepali migrant, community migrant worker group uh, and uh, with the help of other international organizations and our embassy we have been raising this kind of concern to uh, have the access to improved um, all housings and uh, improved living condition of migrant worker. Thank you. Um, I would like to open very soon for your questions, your impressions, but Malcolm, maybe this is the end of the tour, this is the final. If you have a, a summary at the end, what, what what did you learn and what does it bring to you? you? You are creating a new NGO. What is your what is your future and how could you, what is, um, um, is this another, could this add to your, did you meet sponsors or allies or politicians? So. What can we expect for your future? Uh, yeah, for the future, honestly, like not really sure, uh, as is you know the case. But yeah, I did uh, set up an NGO called MigrantDefenders.org. So basically, the idea is to have uh, former migrant workers advocate for the rights of uh, current migrant workers. So, for example, I, I was a, I was a security guard, uh, right? So in Qatar, so I can deal with that aspect because I understand like the whole. Uh, process from recruitment up to placement and uh, my co-founder was a domestic worker uh, in Bahrain so she understands the whole domestic worker you know the whole thing about that so uh, if we could get someone else maybe from uh, food delivery uh, a driver a cleaner uh, basically like all aspects of, 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 of migrant work and then we have them under one roof and then we could be the ones to defend uh, migrant workers, you understand? So that's the whole idea behind the thing. Um, and then, yeah, basically we are still in the process of starting, but we are fully registered. Uh, let's see what the future holds. We're taking it one day at a time. Uh, so, yeah. Haben Sie Fragen? Any questions? Um, with the microphone, I'm not sure, but I can repeat it. So, because for the dolmetscher and for the, the various cameras that are here, Wer hat Fragen? Ich weiß, am Anfang ist man ein bisschen schüchtern. Der Erste möchte nicht, deswegen kommt gleich der Zweite dran. Also wer möchte, wer will, wer hat noch nicht? Ich sehe auch wegen des Theatereffekts, doch da ist jemand. Kräftig und ich wiederhole nochmal die Frage dann. Wunderbar. This would be a question for Jivan because he goes back to Qatar. Uh, why? Where would he do it? Why would he go back if it's so dangerous? Ah, you question is that I could like Jivan Ji. That I Qatar matters to. Ah, so be it. All staff or Ramro na hona hona. That I that I kina firi Qatar e farko na chaan onsa kam ko lagi. Ah, dande baat. Question ko lagi. Ah, lama samay dikhi ma Qatar mein isu. र त्यहाँ प्रवासीलाई भएको विविधताको बारेमा अनौपचारिक रूपमा वेलफेयर सोसाइटी को रूपबाट स्थानीय क्लबहरु या नेपाली राजदूतावास र अन्तर्राष्ट्रिय श्रम संगठनको तर्फबाट हामीले त्यो सहजता र प्रवासी श्रमिकहरुको सुविधाको लागि अधिकारको लागि हामीले धेरै संघर्ष गरेका छौं र यो अवस्थामा म अहिले बिदा को लागि नेपाल मासूर और नेपाल देखिए यहाँ आए कुछ ही और समाता मेरो बिदा सकिनो लाए कुछ सा तो सर तो बनी मा यो बेलमा फॉर्किने सूर और यहाँ रू आइली कतार मा परबासी सर्मी करूं मात्र सही नॉन ब्यावसाई पनी सन तो सर तो हमें त्यां को हमरो लाम संगर्स पछाड़ी के इशुदार भाव कुछ तर यहाँ ले पनी सॉय गर्नु हुन्छ भन्ने जस्तो लाग्छ तसर्थ पनि यो पालीमा कतार जाँदैछ धन्यवाद थ्यांक यू भेरी मच फर द क्वेशन्स यस डेफिनेटली द सिचुएसन अफ माइग्रेन्ट वर्कर इन कतार इज नट गुड एन्ड वी नो देयर हैज बीन स्लाइट प्रोग्रेस स्लाइट इम्प्रूवमेन्ट बट दिस इज नट इनफ सो वी आर स्टिल वर्किंग भेरी हार्ड टु have this human rights realized by the migrant worker community in uh, Qatar and uh, uh, this is one thing another thing that I am in 
currently in my two days, sorry, two month vacation, and I got this after five years. So I will be going back to Nepal first, and then after I complete my vacation, I will be returning back to Qatar. Uh, I know that uh, it is a little uh, sarcastic, but uh, I have to go because I have to support my family back home and I have to have my income and livelihood at the same time. But this is not only the reason that I want to go back to Qatar. At the same time, I want to say uh, that I have been part of the you know community organizer and uh, for the Nepalese migrant worker community. And uh, we have been raising the issues of migrant worker in Qatar. So, uh, so we will we will want to continue and i will want to continue this initiative in qatar and that is also one another reason that i want to go back and contribute uh, to the society uh, demanding the rights of migrant worker uh, and at the same time earn a living for myself to support my family back home thank you Weitere Fragen? Ja, bitte. Uh, yeah, so honestly, I have no idea how all that happened uh, because most of the meetings were held behind like, closed doors. Uh, but definitely uh, the increased pressure from uh, civil society. So this is Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Migrant Defenders, not Migrant, MigrantRights.org, sorry, and then Humanity United, uh, Fair Square, and then Equidem, and then a bunch of other uh, NGOs. So the fact that this was held just when the World Cup was around the corner, I think that added extra pressure for uh, the Qatari government uh, because it was basically like bad PR for them uh, at this particular point. And then you had uh, the Qatar Foundation students. So these were basically just university students. And that was, I think, the highlight of the whole case for me, to be honest, just for students to risk, you know, arrest, to risk all manner of uh, retribution just to send uh, a letter to, to one of the members of the ruling family. That was a big moment for me. Uh, it just goes to show that, and this is something that I always say, you have to separate the Qatari government from the Qatari nationals or the, or the Qatari uh, public. Those are two different things. Uh, the government is not the same as uh, the public. You have to understand that. Uh, we have members of the public who actively want to change things and who are actually involved in trying to change said things. So that happened. And then I also had support from uh, the members of the European Parliament. I think 47 of them signed uh, a letter, uh, sent it to Qatar. Uh, and then various embassies here and there offered their support. And then I mentioned the ILO and the ITUC. So that's the International Trade Union uh, Confederation. So all that pressure plus those closed door meetings. Um, and then I also had Qatari lawyers, which was provided again by the ILO and the ITUC. So all that kind of added to the whole pressure and the whole thing. To be honest, I'm not really sure how I'm here. So. Uh, I, I'm just as, that's a very good question. I should ask myself that question, but you know, um, yeah, that's all I can say, honestly. Yeah. More questions? Otherwise, yes, please. I don't think I would dissuade them from going because whether or not I say anything, like people will still go. People were going to the Gulf even uh, way before I even knew there was, you know, Qatar or Dubai or Saudi Arabia. People have been going there for years and years and years. 
And uh, even as we speak, we have re recruitment agencies who are like actively recruiting people to go to the Gulf. So this is in light of like everything has happened. So people are, I think, fairly aware of what's happening. But when you look at the situation uh, back home, uh, you have limited options. And if there's a chance that you can at least make it in Qatar, uh, people will take that chance. So honestly, like I wouldn't dissuade anyone uh, because five years ago, like I was in that same position uh, and you know, I had no other uh, option at that time. Uh, I wouldn't dissuade anyone. People will still migrate no matter. More questions? Otherwise, maybe one final question. Yes, go ahead. Maybe Krishna, you can answer that. Maybe. Did you translate it? No. Okay. Okay. Um, the question was: Should we watch the World Cup matches, or should we do something else? This is the most critical question we ever been asked throughout the uh, our tour, and uh, maybe I have my ready-made answer. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, um, let me put these uh, things in two different ways, uh, so you might get a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, contextual understanding of what is happening in Qatar and what we have been trying to do as a migrant worker and what uh, you could possibly do as a fan and I will maybe let you de decide your personal choice and making decision whether you want to uh, watch football, enjoy this big moment or just, uh, you know, ignore it. So basically I as a migrant worker always find there are two different sentiment associated with the football uh, and boycott that you already have heard a lot about, lot about uh, the massive violation of human rights, exploitation, sexual abuse, physical torture, uh, and uh, you know, limiting the civic space, freedom of speech, freedom of association, and that all comes together. And at the same time, you also have heard and read about the migrant worker death in Qatar. And there has been a lot of uh, emotional losses and physical damage to the migrant worker and uh, have a very huge cost impacted to those person who has lost their life and their family members. So if we look at it from that perspective, uh, I would say definitely no. Don't enjoy. Restrict yourself. I mean, that's one aspect. But at the same time, there is another side and another sentiment that uh, there are still, uh, you know, 2.6 migrant worker working in Qatar, uh, which is very, very high number than the local population as our moderator already mentioned uh, in previously. And what we have a little bit of skepticism or doubt, let's say, is that if we opt for the boycott right now, it is, I think, quite late. And then if the state retaliate to those poor people who come with the hope to income, uh, make some, uh, you know, a better income and support their family and improve their livelihoods back home and themselves as well. So if the state turn back and be much more brutal than what they are now, then the cost of the losses will be much more bigger than what we have already have. So we as a migrant worker, we have due respect to all those, uh, let's say the emotional losses, physical damage, or the you know financial losses of those migrant worker, but that is already have happened. And uh, why, we will let other people to suffer just because of our individual action, right? So that is one thing, uh, one critical aspect or one critical point that I want to just let leave it here and let you decide and make your personal choice whether we opt for the uh, boycott or not. And then additionally, yes, definitely we as a, let's say human being, football fanatic, fans, right activists, and politicians or academicians, whoever we are, 
let's raise awareness about this all uh, happening uh, to the working class uh, so that we will you know create much more better place uh, and then be critical about what we do so that uh, it will be beneficial for the larger community. I think I would say this. Thank you.